How's it going, listeners and subscribers? So, I have no doubt that some of my more savvy listeners and subscribers have already heard about the Facebook ban of far-right leaders, is how they put it. Okay, uh, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of... Um, sentences here from this Washington Post article because it ties you know right in the line what I've been espousing um, at least in the past five episodes but let's just go ahead and dig into this but Facebook and its counterparts have largely resisted permanent bans holding that objectionable speech is permissible so long as it doesn't bleed into hate and the term hate here is arbitrary and subjective because what one person uh, can perceive as hate uh, might not be perceived by, as hate by the by the next. Okay, so it's it's very subjective and arbitrary there. And Facebook has also been wary of offending conservatives who have become vocal about allegations that the company unfairly censors their speech. So it's not just conservatives. This article, if you if you read it, and I'll leave a link in the description uh, below. I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but if you read this article, it paints this topic of. I mean. We're talking about censorship. Uh, it paints this topic as though it's in strictly the political paradigm, as if only people who you know adhere to politics uh, are being censored. There are people who do not identify as conservative and, and that are outside of that paradigm that are being censored as well. And it says that the bans are likely to be welcomed by civil rights activists, which is just another word in this case for the uh, censorship lobby, okay, that's what they are, uh, who have long argued that these individuals espouse violent and hateful views and that Silicon Valley companies should not allow their platforms to become a vehicle for spreading them. So again, we're going to overcorrect with the tools. Just like a violent person who's intent on committing violence, you can take away his gun, he'll use a knife. You can take away his knife, he'll use a bomb. You can take away his bomb, he'll use fire. You can take away fire, he'll use a screwdriver, okay? And just like these people who are intent on absorbing what they call or what they deem as hate, uh, they'll find another outlet. And what are we going to do? Overcorrect on that too? So we're going to censorship, we're going we're gonna to censor these platforms and affect the vast swaths of people who aren't doing anything to try to curb the actions of a small few who don't care about these laws uh, and who are going to find avenues for their quote-unquote hate regardless. All right, that's what's dangerous about this. But let's continue. Angelo Corazon, president of Media Matters, an organization that has long advocated for more enforcement against white supremacists, said Facebook has been lax against enforcing its policies against hate speech on these accounts because the company doesn't want to deal with the right wing blowback. And there we go again, framing this into a political paradigm. The reality is people are getting killed. There are mass shootings and mass murders that are clearly being connected to ideas like white genocide, which are fueling radicalization, Curson said. The conditions have changed. When you have these massive catalyzing moments that are connected to real-life consequences, it puts pressure on Facebook and others to look in the mirror. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the uh, white nationalism, right, the isms uh, as a catalyst. They're using these narratives, these high-profile incidents, to tie into uh, what the package that they've spun here, the narrative they're spinning, that these media platforms are, sp are becoming a, a cesspool for hate, essentially. So what do we have to do? Uh, we've got to censor, and that's what the censorship lobby is behind. All right, now get this. Facebook has recently signaled that it is willing to take a stronger stance against white nationalism and white supremacy in particular. In March, the company said it would begin banning posts, photos, and other content that reference white nationalism and white separatism, revising its rules in response to criticism that a loophole had allowed racism to thrive on its platform. Now you get the point of my other video where I talk about them using isms as a catalyst. Pick your ism, they're using it as a catalyst. And here we go. Uh, continuing on, we applaud Facebook for taking this positive step towards removing hate actors from the company's platform. As we saw in Christchurch, New Zealand, where a white nationalist was able to live stream the slaughter of 50 people at two mosques, online platforms like Facebook have been used to target communities and spread hate. So there we go. They're using these high-profile incidents uh, to, to carry this agenda, and they keep referencing back to this. And this is how they're going to ultimately censor us all. 
Okay, and it's not just about that, but it sets a dangerous precedent that we're willing to overcorrect after each one of these instances. And like I was making the point before, okay, we could take the gun, we could take the knife, we could take the fire, we could take the bomb, we could take the freaking screwdriver. Okay, they're gonna find a way. Uh, just like this right here, you can you can censor YouTube, you can censor Facebook, but they're gonna find a way. So. It makes me question if that's what, what it's really about. Is it really about keeping us safe? Because since when does the government want to do that? Or is it about taking away our rights and freedoms in the guise of safety? That's a thinker. California Carter, signing off.